Let's see. Slide show here. All righty. So uh, today we are going to continue our discussion of the first part of chapter seven, which talks about uh, how we get microbes to grow. Okay. And specifically, we're going to talk about nutrient needs, things that they eat. All right, so here's the order that we're going to be talking about things. We're going to go over the learning objectives. I'll open it up for questions. Then we will uh, do a bit of math. We're going to um, have some practice in calculating microbial growth. And then we're going to talk about nutrient needs. We're going to talk specifically about carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, trace nutrients and growth factors, and then we'll talk about what to do for next time. Okay, so uh, this chapter helps us move toward being able to meet the following learning objectives. Being able to define the key role of evolution as it applies to microbiology, identify microbial structures, and connect the structures to their functions, identify pivotal components of microbial systems important to human health, analyze and describe the impact of microorganisms. Oops, and I did not open it up for questions. Sorry, I, was, I must have uh, not put that slide in. So, any questions? Okay, if you think of some, let me know. I'm happy to answer them. Okay, let's talk about calculating microbial growth. Okay, going back to chapter three. Uh, let's review how microbes make more of themselves. Uh, specifically in this class, we're mainly interested in bacteria, but if we're talking about eukaryotic asexual reproduction, the same thing applies, okay? So when a cell gets big enough, it divides into two, okay? And in bacteria, we call this process what? Starts with a B. Binary fusion? Vision. Very good. Yes, very good. Then when each of these two cells get big enough, okay, then they each divide. Okay. And so through the process of binary fission, through every uh, what we call generation time, okay, each generation. Uh, we get a doubling of the numbers. Okay, so to show that, uh, here's the first generation. Okay, so I go from one cell to two cells. This is the second generation. I go from two cells to four cells. Okay, so how I calculate this and how I'm, you're going to be calculating this on the exam. Okay, um, because in the past I had this big long formula and people were spending more time trying to figure out the calculator the testing center gave them as opposed to uh, showing me they understood the process. We're gonna be able to, you're gonna be able to do this on your scratch paper, okay? Um, so each time we have a generation, we double our numbers. So for this first set of divisions, okay? We went from one cell, we times it by two and we get two cells, okay? So in the first generation, we get two. Then in the second generation, we have two cells, we times it by two, we get four. If we were to do this a third time, it would be two times four, and that gives us eight. And so that is the level of math you'll need to do on the exam, okay? So let's do a practice one, okay? Uh, you have inoculated, I'm taking a little thing anyway. <laughs> you have inoculated 10 E. coli cells in the broth. Um, at the conditions you provide, their generation time is 20 minutes. How many cells will you have in one hour? Okay. So I'm going to walk you through how to uh, figure out this question. Okay. All right. So the first thing that you need to do is to figure out how many 20-minute segments you have in one hour. In other words, how many times are the cells going to divide? Okay. So in one hour. How many do we have? 
Three. 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 Good job. Okay. All right. So one way to figure this out, if I were to give you something that uh, you couldn't do in your head is, uh, you know, one hour is 60 minutes. So you convert the hour to minutes. You divide it by 20, you get three. Okay. All right. So the next thing you need to do is take your 10 cells and do that binary fission math three times. Okay. So you start out with 10 cells. You times it by two, you get 20 cells. That's the first generation. For the second generation, you have 20 cells. You times it by two, you get 40 cells. So for the third generation, you have 40 cells. You times it by two, you have 80 cells at the end of an hour. Okay. All right. How are we doing? Okay, let's do a little harder question. Okay, a urine sample with more than 10,000 intestinal bacteria is considered indicative of infection, of a bladder infection, okay? Um, so what we do is we take media that selects um, four uh, gram-negative intestinal cells, and we're going to be doing that in lab later on, okay? But you take the urine, you streak it on there, and then you count the number of gram-negative intestinal cells, okay? But you're going to pick up a few just naturally, okay? And that's not necessary, necessarily indicative of a uh, bladder infection, okay, of a urinary tract infection. So let's say we have a urine sample that originally contained 5,000 bacteria, okay? And you have a generation of 30 minutes, okay, at room temperature, and uh, the urine sample didn't get put in the fridge right away. So it's, it sits for three hours before finally being assayed, okay? So how many bacteria will be present in the sample after three hours? So our first question is how many generations? So how many 30 minute segments do you have in three hours? Six. Okay. So we're going to need to take this 10,000 and do that multiplying it by two for each generation six times. Okay. This is where scratch paper comes in handy. Okay. So, you know, three times 30 is 180. So that's figuring out the generations, which we were able to do in the head. Okay. So after three hours, okay, we have. Three, uh, 320,000 bacteria, okay? So I did that math where I, um, let's go ahead and I'll show you what I did. Okay, so you start out with 100,000 and you times it by two, okay? And I generally number them so I can keep track of how many times I've done this. Okay, so I get 200. Yeah. And so I take that 200,000. What, excuse, why are you using um, 100,000 instead of the 5,000? Oh, excuse me. Yes. Uh, I looked, I was looking up here instead of, so yeah, you're right. I was going to get the wrong number. <laughs> I was starting out with the wrong number. See, that's where it's important to very carefully read the question <laughs> and indicate. <laughs> Which parts are important? <laughs> Thank you for catching that, Michelle. <laughs> okay, so, and I was about to slip a decimal badly. Okay, so 5,000 times 2 is 10,000. 10,000 times 2 is 20,000. Okay, and I would continue to do that, and then I would get 320,000. Or, yeah. 320,000 bacteria, okay? So when this comes back, if they didn't know that it sat out for three hours, okay? They're gonna tell this patient they have a bladder infection when they don't, okay? So when your nurses and you're collecting urine samples or actually having the patient collect urine samples that you're gonna take to the lab, uh, take it right away. <laughs> 
Okay, going back to uh, what we talked about last time. Um, why would sticking it in the free in the freezer in the refrigerator stop us from having this happen? If I stuck it in the fridge, I could leave it for three hours and not have this problem. Why? Because in warmer temperatures, it's going to create, it's going to continue growing or producing more bacteria because it's warmer. <laughs> it's warmer, yes. We are exactly right, Sherry. So we are closer to the optimum temperature of bacteria that like to live in the, in the human body. Okay. So remember the mesophiles, so room temperature to body temperature, they grow faster at body temperatures, but dividing every 30 minutes, that's not bad. That's not bad. And there's, uh, not to be gross, there's plenty of nutrients in urine. There's all sorts of good nummies for those bacteria. Okay, so when you stick them in the fridge, you're outside of the optimal growth range and they go to sleep. They go into hibernation and they stop dividing nearly as fast. Okay. All right, do you feel pretty comfortable with this type of math? Um, Teresa, are you going one, two, three? Each one is times two. Right. because of the three hours and there's two per hour. Right, and so I would continue this on through three, four, five, six. I just didn't want to take the time to do that. Does that help? And that's how you get the 320,000 bacteria? Yep. How do you know when to stop? How do you know when like one, two, three, four, five, six, how do you know six is it? Oh, because we have six 30 minute um, segments in three hours. Was that in the, ugh. okay, I'll figure it out. <laughs> oh, well, let, no, let me go ahead and hang over it with you. So I tell you that, um, that it has that at room temperature, we have a generation time of 30 minutes. Okay, mm -hmm. so these bacteria, each one is going to divide every 30 minutes. And I tell you, it sits for three hours. So how many 30 minute segments do we have in three hours? So wouldn't it be six? Exactly. Oh, that's where you got six. <laughs> and that's gotcha. where I got six. Okay. <laughs> And Thank I'm glad you. you, oh, quite welcome. I'm glad you asked that because I'm sure there were other students who were too shy to ask. <laughs> so Thank it's you. good to go over this. Yeah, it's good to go over this until you, you are comfortable with it. Yeah, thank you. And by the, oh, you're quite welcome. I have questions like this in the uh, chapter seven, part one practice quiz. And so you can practice these kinds of calculations, okay? Um, and then also later in the PowerPoint, I have snuck another one in. <laughs> so about the time you're starting to forget, we can review it. And you'll remember it for longer. Okay. Oh, by the way, I, I forgot to put this in. This is called a false positive. Okay. When the test says that this patient has a UTI and they don't. Okay. We don't want to do any false positives. We don't want people to be taking antibiotics if they don't have to. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, moving on to what all those good nummies in urine are. <laughs> okay, we're going to talk about carbon. Specifically, we're going to talk about how uh, microbes get carbon and how they use carbon. Okay, so let us go to the whiteboard. All right, and I forgot to switch chairs. This one does not have a roller. Okay, so carbon. Okay, so just as a reminder, carbon, we abbreviate as C, okay? And it's able to form four bonds, okay? Because it wants four more um, electrons in its valence electron shell and that outside shell. So it's willing to share four of its uh, electrons 
um, in exchange for sharing an electron with another molecule, okay? An electron or two. All right, so where do microbes get carbon? Okay, I'm gonna draw two different kinds of microbes. Okay, so we've got some uh, cute little cyanobacteria here. Uh, they used to be called and are, well, still are called blue-green algae, but they're not algae because they do not have um, a, a nucleus. An algae has nucleus. All right, and then we're going to go ahead and do a, a cute little uh, E. coli here because we do a lot of studying with E. coli. I'm going to make the peptidoglycan pink because when we stain them, they stain pink slash red. Okay. All right. So these cyanobacteria. Okay, are photosynthetic. Okay, and that means that they get their energy from sunlight. Okay, specifically, and not that you need to remember this, but it's interesting. Um, they get it from blue and red light, which, by the way, is the wavelength that uh, plants use. Okay, so this provides energy. Okay. And this light energy allows the bacterium okay, to pull in carbon dioxide. Okay, so that would be a carbon that has a double bonded uh, double bond with uh, two oxygens, okay? And there's carbon dioxide in the air, okay? And so this gets sucked in, and what the uh, bacterium does is it takes the CO2 and it makes sugar out of it. And it has the enzymes to take that sugar and make everything else, okay? So from sugar, it can make more complex carbohydrates and lipids and proteins and nucleic acid. Okay. So, the, um, so basically, this bacterium is self feeding. Okay. It eats air. Okay. So we call that an autotroph. Auto for self and troph for eating. Okay. Now this is where it gets carbon. Okay. So it gets it from CO2. And oftentimes we will slap on the front of this term where it gets its energy from. Okay. And it gets it from light. And so we say they are photo autotrophs. Okay. Okay, questions, questions about that. Okay, now for our cute little E. coli that live in mammalian intestines where there's not a whole lot of light. <laughs> okay, so they are not photosynthetic. They do not have the enzymes to use the energy from light, okay? They also don't have the enzymes to take CO2 and convert it into sugars, okay? Instead, what they do is they bring in sugar or proteins or lipids or whatever, but they'll go for sugar first, okay? And they will bring that in and they will use that for energy, okay? And they'll also use 
and I'm going to draw this with all the carbons, since we're talking about carbon. One, two, three, four, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, there we go. And I'm not gonna draw the hydrogen, but it can split this and it can use this carbon skeleton. Well, that looks a bit like a heart, I think that looks more like a no. Um, to make other molecules, okay? So it uses the sugar as its carbon source. Okay, and as its energy source. Okay, well, where did it get the sugar from? Okay, either directly or indirectly, it got it from either plants or cyanobacteria. Okay. So, um, because it's an intestinal bacterium, I've got to feed them. So when I have an, a lovely ice cream scoop, okay, it's got glucose in it, it's got lactose in it, it's got sucrose in it, it's got all sorts of sugars. It also has lipids and proteins and all sorts of good stuff. But where did the, the milk for the ice cream come from? Where did the sugars come from? Okay, the milk we got from cows that ate the plants, okay? And we get the sugar from the plants that made the sugar, okay? And so then that goes and that feeds the E. coli. So directly or indirectly, we're getting it from these photosynthetic organisms, okay? And we call organisms that have to eat other organisms, okay? Heterotrophs. Okay. Hetero for other. Okay. One way to remember this is heterosexual. You're attracted to the other sex. Okay. And because, so this is where we're getting the carbon. Okay. E. coli are heterotrophs. They have to get their carbon from indirectly or directly from a photosynthetic organism. Okay. And then because they're getting their energy from sugars or proteins or lipids, okay, we call them chemotrophs. Okay, chemo because believe it or not, sugars are chemicals. Uh, just in the usual use, we tend to use chemical to mean things you wouldn't want to eat, but everything are, is chemicals, everything is chemicals. Okay, so if we're, we've got a, a bacterium that is getting its energy from something other than sunlight, okay, we call it a chemotroph. Okay. Except for in weird situations, we do have some that get um, energy from minerals. And we call those litho. Okay, because that's uh, either Latin or Greek for rock. So they're rock eaters. Okay, questions. How are we doing? If a human had E. coli and should they stop sugar so it doesn't increase within, would it work like that if a human ingested it? Would it still be the same? Yes. In fact, if you have a bacterial overgrowth, one of the things they tell you to do is cut out your simple sugars. Yeah, uh, because say you switch from eating sugars to eating starches. And I'm not talking potato starches. I'm, I'm well, uh, uh, starches slash fiber, okay, complex carbohydrates, okay. So what happens is there are other bacteria in your gut that can break that down and then they release sugars that then go to your E. coli. And so you've got a diverse microbiota and it's healthier. If you eat a lot of simple sugars, it goes straight to these guys. They don't share with these guys and you get too many, you get too many E. coli. And that's what we call a bacterial overgrowth. What we mean is an overgrowth of bacteria that are not benefiting you if there's too many of them. <laughs> 
So if you eat fruits and vegetables, you know, uh, more fiber, less simple sugars, okay, generally you have a healthier microbiota. Okay? But these guys are also chemoheterotrophs. They just have more enzymes to break down more stuff than E. coli does. Yeah, you put, you try to grow E. coli in the lab on starch, it's going to say, yeah, whatever, dude. And it's just going to sit and wait until you give it some sugars <laughs> or some protein broth, like uh, soy triptychase agar for those of you in lab. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. Okay, other questions. By the way, it's really hard to cut out sugar if you're used to eating it because these guys release neurotransmitters that uh, that that make you happy when you eat sugar. <laughs> These guys will also release neurotransmitters. So if you eat fruits and vegetables for long enough, you get over your uh, withdrawal from sugar and eventually you get the neurotransmitters that make you crave vegetables. Believe it or not, <laughs> but all it takes is one donut to ruin this. <laughs> all right, let's go back to the PowerPoint. And I'm going to ask you questions. Okay, let me pull up a poll. Okay, so which of the following biomolecules have carbon in them? And there's more than one right answer, and I've made it so that you can pick more than one right answer for this one. Okay, we've got, uh, we're, we're coming up on 50%. Oh, we just broke 50%. Okay, we've got 64%. Ooh, 78. Let's we'll see if we can get to 100. Uh, just for the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and share results. So the favorite, the favorite was carbohydrates, and you are correct. But tell me why it's correct. What's the molecular formula of carbohydrates? They all reduce down to what? Sugar. Oh, they sugar. all reduce down to sugar, yes, which is full of carbon. But I was going for, oops, come on, CH2O. So we definitely have a C in there, okay? The next favorite answer was proteins, okay? Which is correct, okay? Proteins, okay? All of them in their backbone have at least two carbons. Okay, see why I'm making you learn, why I made this, made you learn this stuff back in chapter two? Okay, and depending upon what the side chain is, we've got all sorts of other carbons, okay? All right, the next favorite one is lipids, which also has carbons, okay? And nucleic acids, which also have carbons because for one, they have a sugar, okay? And then we attach a phosphate to it. And then we've got a base, okay? That has all sorts of carbon in it, okay? So all of these are correct. Good job. All right, on to the next question. 
okay, if a microbe does not have access to bioavailable carbon, okay, that means carbon it can use. So unless it's photosynthetic, it's got to be something other than uh, CO2, okay, and they've got to have the enzymes to be able to break it down, okay. So let us relaunch the poll. Now this one's a harder question, okay. If a microbe does not have bioavailable carbon, what will happen to it? And this time we'll have you pick just one answer. Okay. 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 okay, we're coming up on 50%. Good job. Okay, we're at 85%. Let's see if we can get to 100%. Ah, looks like we're kind of stalled at 85%. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. Okay, the favorite answer wins D, which is correct. All of these can happen. Okay, depending upon the micro. So if you pick B, it will stop growing, or C, it will die. You are correct. Okay. So let's talk about all of these in the order that uh, that we, you were uh, that uh, you picked. Okay. This one, you know, definitely is correct. Most of you picked that one. So it'll stop growing. Okay, so most bacteria are able to shut down their growth and kind of wait it out. Now, the question is, is how long they can wait it out, okay? If they form endospores, they can wait indefinitely. We have some endospores that we know have been sitting on the shelf in a lab dry for 60 years. And so far, when we take them out and put them in a liquid media, with all sorts of food, they will continue to hatch out. We have endospores that we have discovered in closed Egyptian tombs. So we found them thousands of years later, okay? And they will still hatch out. Endospores are kind of the top of the, the top of the, the scale there. If you cut off, say, an intestinal bacterium from food, um, from carbon, it can wait, okay, in that nice, warm, moist environment for quite a while before it starts attacking your intestinal lining. Okay, it's got to it's got to go looking for a carbon source somewhere. Okay, um, but if it's sitting out, um, they can dry out and they die sooner. Okay, so there's lots of conditions uh, indicating how long they can wait. Um, eventually they'll die. They will die if they don't get a carbon source. Okay. Unless apparently they're an endospore. Okay. Now with this one, nobody picked unless you picked all of the above. Okay. So some bacteria actually have flagella that they can swim around looking for food, looking for a carbon source. Interesting, huh? And if times are good, let's use your intestinal bacteria as an example. When times are good, they'll grab a hold and just wait for the food to go past. If food stops going past, they'll either start eating into your intestinal lining or they'll turn on the genes for flagella, make flagella and start swimming, okay? In lab, we kind of did this with our sagebrush fungi, okay? We sterilized the outside of the leaf. We were looking for just the microbes on the inside of the leaf. And we knew after about a week, those fungi were gonna run out of food from the sagebrush leaf, okay? Normally the sagebrush makes sugars, feeds it to the, the endophyte. The endophyte makes other nutrients, gives it to the plant leaves. But we pulled those plant leaves off of the sagebrush and so they were buying, okay? So the endophytes were able to eat the dead plant cells. When they run out of that, what did they do? They grew out onto the auger. 
They went looking for another carbon source, okay, by dividing. Interesting. Yeah, interesting. Okay, any questions? Okay, here's another one. Okay, speaking of our lab experiment. Okay, how would we classify the endophytes that live inside of a plant leaf? Okay, would it be considered a chemoautotroph, a chemoheterotroph, a photoautotroph, or a photoheterotroph? Yeah, this one's a little harder. Okay, we're at 78. It's kind of stalled. And I have uh, uh, two more atoms to go over. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. Okay, we have a tie. We have a tie between chemoheterotroph and photoautotroph. Okay. Um, so we do have quite a few people that picked uh, chemoautotroph and photoheterotroph, okay? But let's go ahead and talk about chemoautotroph and photoautotroph and why you picked those, okay? If it were me, I would have narrowed it down to that, okay? Because this is a fungus that's living in symbiosis with sagebrush, and we know sagebrush is a photoautotroph, okay? Because they're green, they sit out in the sunlight, we don't think of them as making sugars, but they do just no carbohydrates that we can eat, okay? So it would make sense that a fungus that's living in association with a photoautotroph would also be a photoautotroph, okay? But actually fungi are not capable of photosynthesis, okay? So we have to eliminate all of the photo options, okay? Come on. Okay, so it wouldn't be a photoautotroph, okay? Uh, we, so it's got to be a chemo something, okay? So the question is, is it getting its carbon source from another living creature, from chemical processes, okay? Or is it able to make its own sugars from CO2, okay? And actually what's happening, okay, let's, uh, let's get our sagebrush leaf here. Unfortunately, when I'm in the PowerPoints, I can't switch colors, okay? So here's the leaf. This is the photoautotroph, okay? And then I have fungi that are living inside, okay? Which sounds kind of creepy, okay? But these are chemoheterotrophs. So the plant makes sugar that it made through sunlight and pulling in CO2, and it shares that with the fungus. The fungus makes nutrients that the plant can't make itself, okay? And so it shares it back and forth, okay? So it's kind of like, hey, you make this product I want. Here, have some sugar. This one says, thank you for the sugar, here. Let me make this very complex molecule that you don't have the enzymes to make. Okay. So um, B is the correct answer. Okay. 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 All right. And one way to remember okay, is the only organisms that are photoautotrophs okay, are some bacteria and archaea and plants and algae. Everything else has to get their carbon sources from someplace other than 
carbon dioxide. Okay, questions. Do you have any questions about why this is the right answer? Okay. Oh, and I already gave you the answer to this one. <laughs> the sagebrush plant is considered a photo water cell. All right, so now we're going to move on to nitrogen. We're going to talk about how microbes get nitrogen and how microbes use nitrogen. Okay. So let's go back to the whiteboard. Clear the drawing. Okay, nitrogen. And okay, we abbreviate as N, okay, is a little smaller than oxygen or a little bigger than oxygen. Smaller, like smaller. Um, it's between carbon and oxygen. Okay? So it can form three covalent bonds. Okay? It needs three more electrons to be in that outer valence electron shell to be full. Okay? Well, nitrogen in the atmosphere, because it can form three covalent bonds, exists as a gas that has these three covalent bonds. And we also abbreviate that, whoops, it's starting to do nitrogen. Um, this covalent bond, this triple covalent bond is really, 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 really hard to break. Okay? Um, because these guys are tight. They are sharing six electrons and it's really hard to get in there and break up this, uh, this click, if you want to think of it that way, okay? So just for the fun of it, let's go back to cyanobacteria. Okay. Photosynthetic autotrophs. Okay. Um, with the um, cyanobacteria that we have studied the most, okay, called anabana. You don't have to remember that, but they form these funky, what we call heterocysts. Okay, so I've got a chain of cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, and I'm looking at it under the microscope, and I see these green little cocci, and then I see this big old black thing. I've decided to draw it blue, okay? Okay, so we call this a heterocyst. Okay, because it looks like a cyst like you would get in your body, and it's different from the others, okay? So while these guys are pulling in CO2, okay, and making sugars, these guys are pulling in nitrogen gas, and they have an enzyme that can split this triple bond. It's an expensive enzyme. It takes a lot of energy, okay? But they split this bond, okay? So we separate these two nitrogens and we put on hydrogens to keep it happy, okay? So that's what these heterocysts are doing. And this NH3 is ammonia, okay? Now, once I split these two nitrogens, I can take this ammonia and I can slap it on to a small acid and I can make an amine group, okay? Like what we see in, a, in an amino acid, okay? So we call this process of splitting nitrogen gas to make ammonia or some other bioavailable nitrogen source, we call this nitrogen fixation. And not very many organisms can do this, okay? Because it's expensive. So pretty much for the purposes of this class, okay? Um, only bacteria can do it. Okay, 
So we would not be able to make proteins or nucleic acids if it were not for nitrogen fixing bacteria. Okay. In this situation, okay, the photosynthetic cyanobacteria say, here, have some sugar. And the heterocyst says, oh, thank you. Have some ammonia. Okay. And so they're the same species, but it's like this one has specialized, okay? Because it's very, very expensive. And also, um, oxygen kills the enzyme that does this. Now, later on, we're going to talk about metabolic pathways. Photosynthetic organisms, you know, release oxygen, okay? Uh, that's part of the photosynthetic process. So what they do is the heterocysts wall themselves off from oxygen so they can continue to fix, nit uh, to fix nitrogen. They, they bring in the nitrogen from the atmosphere. They, they transport it in. They transport ammonia out. Okay? But they have to protect themselves from oxygen. Okay? Now, interestingly, let's talk about plants for a minute. Okay? So I'm going to draw a little pea plant. Okay. There's its little roots. Okay, and we've got some leaves that are photosynthetic. So it's able to make its own um, sugars, okay, but it can't fix nitrogen, okay. So there are some plants like peas that will send out signals when they get big enough. Okay, they will send out signals saying, hey, I'm looking for a buddy. Okay, and we will have bacteria that are capable of nitrogen fixing, but they're not fixing nitrogen when they're in the soil and exposed to air. When they get this signal, they say, oh, there's a plant that wants to form a good working relationship. There's a job opening. So they come over and the cell, the, the roots kind of wrap around these bacteria and we form little nodules okay, that have these nitrogen fixing bacteria inside of them. Okay? And so the plant protects the bacteria from oxygen and they set up a relationship similar to what's happening in the antibiotic. Um, they make sugars, in their leaves, they send it down the stem, okay? And they also use it themselves, okay? But they send it to these bacteria. And these bacteria make ammonia, okay? And it sends it to the plant and they have a good working relationship, okay? All legumes, okay, do that. Peas, alfalfa, Okay, some beans, okay, uh, have this good working relationship with nitrogen fixing bacteria, okay? All right, so all of the nitrogen that we get, okay, because if you give me ammonia, I'm gonna die. <laughs> I do not have the enzymes to take ammonia and to slap it onto acetic acid, okay? Uh, so instead, I eat proteins, and nucleic acids from plants and from animals, okay, if you are an omnivore, and uh, that's where we get our nitrogen from, okay? But indirectly, we got it from bacteria. Okay, questions? Okay, let's go up here. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Whoops. And I'm gonna ask you some questions. Okay, which of the following uh, biomolecules have nitrogen in them? Okay, we've got some good voting going on. We're coming up on 
There we go. We just broke this. Okay, we're at 71, 78. Okay, just for the sake of time, I'm gonna close the poll. Okay, so the favorite answer was protein. Good job, very good job. So all proteins have an amino group. So they all have nitrogen. Okay. And we'll go ahead and put a blank in here just so we'll find it. Okay. All right. The next favorite answer was nucleic acids. Good job. This is also correct. Okay. So I'm gonna put my sugar down here, here's my phosphate group, and here I have what is called a nitrogenous base. In other words, I have this funky, and I left the carbon out accidentally, this funky circle or double circle, come on, stop it. Excuse me, it's not being swapped over. Stop, I'm going the wrong direction. There we go. Okay, so nucleic acids have nitrogen in them. Okay. Uh, lipids can have nitrogen, but they're modified lipids, and it's not very often. Okay. Carbohydrates, same deal. We can have some modified carbohydrates that have nitrogen in them, but they're much more rare than the proteins in the nucleus. Okay. So if I were to ask this on a test question and you only had one option, uh, picking the proteins in nucleic acids. Okay. Although, even though technically these are correct, I might give you partial points for that. Okay. All right. How are we doing? Okay, let's talk about phosphorus. And let's clear the board. Okay. So phosphorus is um, much bigger okay, than the atoms we've talked about previously. We abbreviate this as P. And it can form five covalent bonds. Okay? Kind of funky, huh? How we generally see it, at least for the purposes of this class, Okay, is forming a double bond with an oxygen, okay? A single bond with another oxygen that has a hydrogen, so with a hydroxyl group. And then it will be bonded to a carbon. Or instead of a hydrogen here, we have another phosphate. Oh, I put two oxygens, I didn't have two oxygens. And we call this a phosphate group. Okay, and we can either abbreviate that as uh, um, P O 3 H, depending upon whether it's uh, connected to something else, but generally H2. Okay, or we'll go really fast and do that. Okay. All right, so organisms need phosphate, okay? Because they need them for their nucleic acids. Okay, so if I am to draw a nucleotide, okay, all nucleotides have a sugar phosphate backbone. This and drawing any kind of skinny wampus, and then we've got our nitrogenous base sticking right here. Okay. All right. So they need them to make their nucleic acid. Okay. And then also we have 
phospholipids in our membranes. Okay, all cells that I know of have phospholipids. Okay, so I've got my hydrophobic tails that are doing this funky kick thing. Okay, and I have phosphate groups in the hydrophilic heads, and that's what gives these hydrophilic heads their negative charge. Okay. So to make membranes and to make DNA and RNA, you've got to have phosphate groups. Okay. So the question is, where do microbes get it? Okay. Um, uh, originally, you know, there was inorganic phosphate floating around in the environment, but pretty much um, organisms get their phosphates either from other cells or from minerals okay, that are fossilized remains. We'll say fossilized. They're not really fossilized, but uh remains okay so let's say i've got an ocean okay a prehistoric ocean okay and i've got all sorts of plankton floating around here okay and eventually plankton dies okay and they they come down and they they land on the mud okay and then i get another layer of mud and eventually this turns into rock and uh, simplot, okay, comes and mines this rock and puts it into plant fertilizer. Okay, okay so originally it came from prehistoric algae, okay? Um, so unless you are a, a, a plant on a farm, okay, uh, you're not going to have access to uh, the, the minerals that way. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's put a rock here. Okay, and this rock has all sorts of phosphates in it. Okay, um, unless you have Simplot around to, to chew up the rock, okay, what they have to do is they have to leach the phosphate out of the rock. Okay. And fungi are really good at doing this. Okay. So, fungi, either in the soil or if they're a part of a lichen, okay, here's another symbiotic relationship where the fungi is living in association with a photosynthetic microbe. Okay. So, once again, the, the photosynthetic microbes are providing the sugar okay, that they get from sunlight. Okay. Meanwhile, the fungi produce acids from the sugar, okay, and that acid leaches out the phosphate, okay, so they pull it out and they share some of the phosphates and other minerals that they got from the rock with the photosynthetic organism that's producing the sugar, okay, cool, right? Okay, questions? Questions about the phosphate cycle. Okay, so I have a question that I'm not going to spend the time for, but make sure you know which biomolecules have phosphates in them. Okay. Especially as a uh, nut. This next week, but after spring break, we're going to start talking about metabolism. We're going to be talking about phosphate containing nucleotides that are very important in metabolism. I'm talking about ATP. Okay, so now we're going to talk about trace nutrients and growth factors. Okay. Go ahead and clear the drawings. Okay, I'm going to start out with a macro example okay, that you're familiar with, and then I'm going to go from there to talk about things that you're less familiar with, but kind of draw an analogy. Okay? 
All right, so red blood cells have what mineral, what metal in them? Iron. Iron. And iron is abbreviated as FE. Okay, but we'll go ahead and put that in key up here. Okay. And this iron has a charge. Okay. And it is a part of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin forms kind of a funky cage. Okay. Okay, my, my hemoglobin cage is especially bad today. Excuse me. But anyway, it forms a uh, um, organic cage, okay, that holds an atom of iron. And the whole point of that is for it to hold oxygen until it can release it to the other cells in your body, okay? Now, you don't need a whole lot of iron, okay? This is what we call a trace nutrient, okay? You definitely need some iron, okay? Because otherwise you get iron poor blood, you get anemia, okay? Because you're not able to make as many red blood cells, you're not carrying as much oxygen, and you're tired just sitting there. Getting up and doing anything is not even an option because you know your blood wouldn't be able to carry oxygen to your muscles. Okay. But you need some. Okay. You don't need as much as the macronutrients. Okay. Macro or big nutrients are the nutrients that make up most of your biomolecules. Okay. So carbon oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, okay, those are all macronutrients, okay? Trace nutrients, you just need a little bit of, okay? Now, there are bacteria that need oxygen, okay? And to use oxygen in metabolism, they need iron, okay? And the reason why they need iron Okay, is because they have an enzyme that has iron at the active site, okay, so that it can either pick up an electron and pass it on to the next guy, okay, or say I've got a substrate, iron has this positive charge, okay, and I'm an enzyme, and I have a substrate that has all of these negative charges, that's gonna attract it to the active site and enable the enzyme to go snip, okay, and spit out two products, okay? So, you know, uh, microbes need iron, okay? They also tend to need magne um, yeah, magnesium and manganese and zinc. Is this sounding familiar? These are generally the things we humans need. So anything that an organism needs a little bit of, we call a trace nutrient. Okay. Some need copper. All right, so on to growth factors. Uh, trace nutrients tend to be inorganic. They tend to be minerals. Okay. And we can, uh, well, we won't go into those. Okay, but growth factors. Okay. okay, growth factors are organic molecules. Okay. okay, that the organism can't make itself. Okay. So cyanobacteria, okay, it can make everything, okay? All it needs is sunlight, okay, CO2, and some minerals and tap water. And it can make all of the oops, biomolecules, okay, that it needs, okay? All of the carbs, all of the proteins, 
lipids, okay, and nucleic acids that it needs, okay? Not all cells are that lucky, okay? Somewhere along the line, they had a mutation that they could not make all of these things, okay? So going back to the macro example you're familiar with, okay? We humans, okay, cannot make all of our amino acids, okay? If I remember correctly, there are eight essential amino acids that we have to import from the outside. They have to be in our diet. Otherwise, we get sick. Okay. Um, there are also okay, non-amino acids that we can't make ourselves that are a part of enzymes. Okay. So we'll say that there is a chunk here okay, that we need. Or there is another little guy that carries, oh, just for the fun of it, because we're going to be talking about it in chapter eight, acetyl groups, okay? These three carbon groups, okay? And we can't make them, okay? Our, the genes that, that would help us to make them um, have mutations in them that have killed the gene, okay? So we call these vitamins. B vitamins, vitamin A, actually, which goes into making some lipids, okay? Your fat-soluble vitamins are precursors, okay, to lipid structures that our cells need, okay? Um, B vitamins, okay? Um, vitamin C, okay, these are growth factors that we can't make, okay? Bacteria have the same thing going on. And it just depends upon the bacterium as to what growth factor they need, okay? So let's say that I'm trying to grow mycoplasma. Mycoplasma, let me do this. which is a bacterium that it's lost the ability to make a peptidoglycan cell wall, okay? Instead, it reinforces its cell membrane, its plasma membrane with steroids that are very similar to cholesterol. Okay, so what they do, okay, mycoplasma pneumoniae, if it gets into my lungs, it will kill my cells to get the cholesterol, and then it takes the cholesterol and uses it to make its cell membranes, okay? If I grow it in the lab, I have to feed it cholesterol. That is a growth factor for mycoplasma, okay? Um, so depending upon the type of microbe, okay, they either need more or fewer of these growth factors, the more they need okay, the more growth factors, the richer the uh, nutrition we need to provide, okay, the more fastidious. Okay, fastidious is a fancy dancy word for picky. Okay, so cyanobacteria is not fastidious, okay? I just give it water and set it on the, the windowsill and it's happy, okay? Whereas E. coli, you know, E. coli, I've got to give it some sugar, I've got to give it a few amino acids, you know, a nitrogen source. It's not terribly fastidious. It's more fastidious than cyanobacteria, but less fastidious than, say, mycoplasma, okay? Um, so anyway, I think that's it. We're about out of time. Any questions on trace nutrients and growth factors? All right, let's go to what to do for next time. Oh, and I had this other question. There's a similar question in the practice quiz, but uh, let me know if you, uh, well, you can, uh, scroll through and get the answer to this one. But I would suggest trying to do it in slideshow mode and try to work out the question yourself. And then um, 
uh, then pull, you know, click and get the answers. Okay. All right. Case study number two is due on Friday. Okay. Uh, there are some of you that I haven't quite gotten to your case study two. I've got your name on a list. I'm going to grade your case study two. With that in mind, I'm not going to take points off for the things that I didn't tell you to change in enough time. Okay. Um, exam two is available until Saturday. Okay. And as you study this chapter seven, I strongly suggest that you go back and take a look at chapters two and chapter three, because you really need them to understand this chapter. Okay. All right. Any questions? <laughs>